Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. If you're paying attention, you know that you only make money when you work. It might be great money, but it's dependent on you. The information on this podcast will help you solve that. We interview experts and provide analysis into financial freedom through commercial real estate. Why? To help physicians like you thrive. Let's dive in. Welcome to Surgeon Syndicate. This is your host, Dr. Michael McManus, and we are here today with Michael Holdwick. Michael's a real estate investor with over 10 years of experience in all kinds of real estate as a side hustle. Professionally, he has a background in engineering and construction and still works close to full time building a $40,000 a month real estate business. He has six commercial buildings with almost 30 tenants. Michael, welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. How are you? So honored to be here. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Oh, you're welcome. So tell us a little bit more about your story. So you're an, an engineer by trade, how you, you wandered into the real estate arena. Yeah, absolutely. I, I always like to start with a little bit of my personal background. So I come from a, a very much a blue collar family. My dad was a construction worker, road builder. He was the type of guy that worked a lot of hours, right? So he was a six or seven day a week guy. Every hour that he could work, he was working. And my mom was a hairdresser. So very much blue collar, hardworking. And I grew up in the suburbs of, of Metro Detroit here. When I grew up, I, I went off to college and studied civil engineering. So I kind of followed my dad into that infrastructure path, but I knew I didn't want to work the hours that he worked. You know, So I was like, it's a cool career. The concept of it spoke to me. I love building things. I love designing things and seeing things come to life. So I, I went to school to study civil engineering and then ended up going more of the consulting route. So when I, I graduated, I started working for an architectural and engineering company that uh, specializes in airport design. So that's actually still what I do to this day. I work four days instead of five, but I work for an architectural and engineering company as a, a project manager, a client manager, a team leader, and kind of a, a technical expert to deliver airport infrastructure projects. So runways, taxiways, terminals, hangar buildings, lighting systems, landing systems, you name it, and we design it. All right. So... I don't know, just my, when you start talking about those things, you know, that I, I've never invested or been to close to anything involving an airport. Are the hangars at the airport, when you stand in there in the airport and you see all these outbuildings, are those owned by the airport in least, or are those owned by individual peoples? The, the, the airlines own them. Who owns those buildings? Yeah, it's actually all of the above. I would say most commonly at like a large commercial service airport, like a, you know, a DTW here, Detroit's in my backyard. Most of the hangars are either owned by the airlines or private businesses, and they're just leasing from the airport on a land, land lease basis. Um, sometimes the airport will own hangar buildings and then rent that space out to tenants if there's multiple tenants to, to store their aircraft. So it, it really just depends. Okay. So like a yeah. lot of commercial real estate, it's in uh, all kinds of different <laughs> setups. So, yep. so it's always a little sidetrack, like, wait a minute, I've never heard about owning a, a hangar that you lease to United, but it probably works the same way. Yeah. So you started out in engineering and I'm sure that was part of your, you know, your trip into doing commercial real estate. How did you first get involved? Because it doesn't sound like it was a, a legacy thing that your parents weren't doing this. No, not at all. I really didn't know anybody truthfully growing up that owned investment real estate or really even a second home. You know, that's just not where I grew up at. When I started working full time, my wife and I started out in an apartment and then we kind of, as we established ourselves, bought our first home. And the week that we bought our first home, believe it or not, was it was October 2008. And if you remember what happened in October 2008, it was actually the month that Fannie and Freddie declared bankruptcy and the residential housing market in the United States started melting down. So it was that same week that we closed on our first home. So the experience for me in real estate started out really rocky because at that time, you know, being very vulnerable as somebody that was in the first few years of their career, we really didn't know where to turn. All of a sudden we had this mortgage and we didn't know where the bottom was at. And you know, there were some really tough times over the next three or four years, I would say. 
But fortunately for us, we kind of started to really establish ourselves in our career. And we moved on to that next phase where we were going to start a family. So in 2013, my wife and I were expecting our first child, our daughter. And we decided that the house that we were in wasn't our forever home. So we got into real estate investing like so many people do. We actually decided to hold on to the home that we lived in, convert it into a rental. We moved to our new house and started renting that property back to a tenant that was actually in Metro Detroit because they were involved in the automotive industry. They were an Asian expat from Japan and they had a family and they wanted a family home to live in. So we we started out that lease making about $1,000 net cash flow. And this was in 2013, like I said. So at that point in time, that was kind of like a life-changing amount of money for me. And I was like, oh my God, like <laughs> I just need to do this over and over and over again. And I, I was hooked from that point on. I was, I was absolutely hooked. That's, you know, what's awesome about that is that I had a similar road, but it didn't pan out as well because my first house, I bought a townhouse while I was in medical school and then put an extra bedroom in the basement and leased it out. And that all went great. But yeah, right at that same time, I think we bought that house in July of 08. <laughs> and so yeah. two years later, we decided to, to move to another city. And it was underwater, you know, we would have had to write a, a large check to, to get out of it. So we rented it out, but you were a much better leasing agent than we were because <laughs> we got a deadbeat who paid about a half a month's rent once. We ended up having to take him to, to court to get him evicted because he was an expert, not rent payer. Uh. <laughs> and so I congratulate you on doing a much better job in, in leasing out the first time when you, when you move beyond a home and lease it out than I did. So, yeah, well, you know, when you get into it, everybody has the jitters for the first one. Right. So I was just as nervous as everybody else, but I think the thing that gave me confidence and, and maybe I just lucked out in this way was our first tenant's rent payment was backed by his company because he was oh. here for a work assignment. So that was really key in me getting over the hump because I was in a situation where if I didn't collect rent for a few months, you know, like it was going to be tight making that mortgage payment. So yeah. once it was back, back by the company, I had the peace of mind. I knew if there were, you know, routine things that would come up, I could do it. I wasn't paying for handyman services or really any contractors at that point in time it was all bootstrap, but I think that was really key for me to get into that first deal. That's pretty awesome. I don't, I don't know of many people who, with a uh, residential property, get a corporate back lease. <laughs> yeah. That's 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 why you move into doing triple net deals is you get corporate back leases instead of just uh, personal backing. Absolutely. So, so from there, so did you just was that then it on to to buying more homes or how did things progress for you? Yeah, I kind of dumb locked into my next one, but it was a similar model. It was the next town owner over, but it was a really good neighborhood. It was a good family neighborhood. And I actually um, just found an exceptional deal on a government auction website of all places. When I was, I was there looking at a different property, realized I didn't qualify to buy that property because I wasn't an owner occupant, but stumbled onto another one that was an exceptional deal and just you know put a bid in on it and was the successful bidder. And you you remember that time, it was uh, late 2013, early 2014, and there were still a lot of foreclosures to be had. So I, I got this 2,200 square foot house for 125 grand, and it was in a nice walkable neighborhood. Aesthetics were terrible though. It was built in the mid 60s and it still had everything from the mid 60s. So we went in and gutted the whole thing. And I think I put like 35 or 40 grand into it and bootstrapped a lot of that stuff with a one-year-old daughter at home and and my wife not too happy with me but I I just had that bug and and then again we started spreading that one out for about a $1000 a month net cash flow above and beyond what our mortgage was and our, our cost basis so then I had two and I was at $2000 a month and I was 2 years into my real estate journey and rented those out for two, three, four years. And in 2018, I thought that like the residential real estate market was getting really hot and overpriced. And I just 
I felt the pressure of that market cycle. And I thought we were going to have a little bit of pullback and we were at the peak of values. And um, by that point in time, I'd actually struck up a relationship with my now business partner. But at that point in time, he was a friend of a friend and he was a commercial broker. So he started to kind of educate me about the value of investing in commercial real estate. And then at that point in time in my life, we now had two kids. I was taking on a lot more responsibilities at work because I was still working full-time. My wife was working full-time, building a family, managing two rental properties. And I was kind of at that breaking point where I was like, you know what? I think now is a time for me to pivot because if I want to scale there's no way that I can reach my financial freedom number with single family residential houses because the prices were climbing too, right? So there was less margin there. But then, you know, the thought of having 10 roofs and 10 furnaces and 10 AC <laughs> units and, you know, 10 different families in a house 24 hours a day was, it just didn't work with my mindset. So I pivoted to commercial and was really looking for scale, was looking to, you know, have professionals and businesses as tenants rather than individuals and families looking for double net and triple net leases where I had less responsibilities versus the gross leases where I still needed to worry if you know the lawn was getting mowed type things. So I just kind of added all that up and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to sell that first single family home that we had in 1031 the uh the proceeds and look for a commercial property and and try it. I I had never owned a commercial property, but it spoke to me at that point in time. That's awesome. So what was your first commercial property? It was actually a, a radiology practice. So a medical office building, or maybe what we would call it now is a medical outpatient building. It's in Gross Point. So Gross Point's like a really affluent suburb in, in Metro Detroit. And it's it's very like 1950s vibe. So it's got a two lane divided boulevard through downtown. And it has all these hundred year old buildings lining the streets with very walkable and you know tree lined and, and all that. And this building is actually three smaller units. If you can picture like older downtown buildings kind of combined together to be like a 4,200 square foot radiology practice. So they do imaging for you know mammograms, x-rays. MRIs, things like that. And the situation was actually, the real estate was actually owned by some of the original partners in the practice, but that partnership had kind of moved on, right? Because it was established in the 1950s. So some of the original partners had passed away and that was in an estate situation. Some of them were no longer part of the practice, but still own like a fractional share in the real estate. And I think they just got to that point where they're like, okay, we need to just sell this real estate and let the radiology practice operate it, but not actually own it. So they put it on the market. It was listed at $480,000 and I actually ended up closing on it for uh, $440,000. Oh. But the numbers were astronomical because at that point in time, it was a double net lease. So I owned the exterior of the building, the roofs and the mechanicals, but they were paying $6,500 a month for something that I bought for 440 k so I brought 200 grand into the deal. My note was 200. So it was only like $2,000 a month and I was getting 6,500. So I took what was $1,000 a month in that house and turned it into over $4,000 a month in medical office. Nice. Wow. That's a, you were just a killer from the start. <laughs> I don't know about that. I, I am very <laughs> analytical, as you'll probably pick up on. I do like to take disproportionate risks. So I kind of evaluate the downside and the upside. And I want far more upside than I have downside, right? So I, I saw this. And the only real downside here was it was on a short term, term lease. So when I bought the property, there was only like 18 months left on it. Okay. And I was kind of rolling the dice that they were going to extend. But there was good demand in the area. So I knew if they weren't going to be in it, I could find somebody else. And the remaining lease that they had was going to more than half pay for the property. So I looked at it as even if they move on and I got to carry this thing for three or six months to retenant it, I have this building almost mostly paid for with this deal that I have in front of me. So how can you lose in that situation? And 
Fast forward to today, they're still actually the tenant. They've renewed a couple different times. They've actually negotiated down their payment a little bit. So they're not paying that 65 anymore, but it's still a really good payment. And I still really love this deal. And it, it was a great first commercial deal. Man, that's so, you know, you, you've bought some stuff and it's really interesting how the, you know, you, your whole history that your first rental, you got a, a, a corporate backed lease on a residential property. Then you bought a one out of auction. And I've looked at auctions and I've never seen anything that was anywhere close to, and maybe there's just more people looking now, or, or I don't know that, that are, or maybe I just don't look hard enough, but I, but I've, I haven't ever gotten close on an auction. And then to take your first commercial deal and, and get it at that price with that kind of a lease, that's incredible. Was that a lot of work to find that or? Was it just kind of sitting there for sale? Yeah, it was actually just listed. It had been on the market for, I don't know, four or five months. So this wasn't some you know, exceptional stroke of luck that just fell in, into my lap. But I think it really stemmed from having a good relationship with Larry, who is now my business partner. But at that point in time, as I mentioned, he was my broker. He knew what I was looking for. He knew that I was looking for something that was hands-off, had good income that I could scale and had kind of limited landlord responsibility. So we went on a deep search because I was under the pressure of a 1031. We did uh. not have this property identified prior to close. So I had 45 days to identify that property. So we had this one and we evaluated probably 50 deals, right? And then we narrowed it down to a short list of three. But this one always kind of had my eye because the numbers were just so much better than every other deal that we were looking at at that time. So I think I was really naive because it was my first deal and there was some risk there that I wasn't seeing, but I love the upside of the deal. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that when you have an established business picking up and moving now, radiology might be a little less sticky than I think a lot of doctor's offices because they're not seeing patients there, but man, that, you know, they don't tend to move. They're they're yeah. pretty sticky tenants, and that's uh, like you said, they're still there. Yeah, they Not they a, had just put in a new MRI machine that I understand to be, you know, almost a million dollars. <laughs> they had renovated the office to make room for this thing and cut open the wall to get it in, and that was just a oh. year or two before I took on the lease. So that was kind of like another one of those cues. Like, are they really going to pick up stakes and leave after just yeah. kind of purchasing this equipment and and moving on? And this is their only outpatient center. The rest of their the real estate is inside the hospital. So. Oh, that's uh, yeah, that no, that you you actually I think evaluated your risk pretty well there because that's unusual. And if they if it was only a year old MRI, to just some of the stuff that we've done that was much smaller than that, the idea of tearing it out and moving it to another building a year after you installed it, you you know the chances of that are low. Yeah, that's great that you found that though. I've, I you know I see a lot of people they're buying. You know, ten thirty ones. They're buying five caps. They're just yeah. they got to get re, they got to get it redeployed. They're not they're not hitting home runs on the ten thirty one. Well, that's a part of my my real estate philosophy is I'm a value add guy, so I I just can't it, five caps, six caps, anything ten caps. They don't resonate with me. Like I'm looking for scale and yield, even if there's risk involved. So if there's a vacancy. Or if it's mismarketed, or if you know it needs improvements, I'm willing to put in that time and money to get it where I want it to be. But I just, it's hard for me to understand the attractiveness of of low cap rate deals. <laughs> I think it's more just you know that that I know the the people who do a lot of them, I think, are doing things like that. It's supposed to be very low risk. Yeah. You know, it's it's a Starbucks. It's it's something that you got a great corporate guaranteed lease that it's not going to, you know, change in the near future. But sure. But then people, you know, it wasn't that long ago, people were buying apartment buildings at four and five caps. So yeah, that's uh, yeah, totally. I mean, look at yeah. Rite Aid and all the the drugstores now too, right? Those were the darlings five and ten years ago of the the low cap rate scene. But some of those companies are moving on. So I think I look at it a little bit differently. I see low risk in good cost basis. So I can look at a piece of real estate, even if it needs some improvements, even if I know that tenant is going to be in there, I know if I have a low cost basis, 
I can always create yield from that property because in a recession, I can win a race to the bottom where somebody that's buying at a five cap, if market conditions change, you're toast. I mean, that property is underwater and it's not going to cash flow, especially with today's interest rate. So I actually look at that situation the opposite where I, low cost basis is safety to me. So that's kind of your your key to your philosophy is is where you're starting at. Yeah. So after that one, so are you sourcing your deals mostly through your your partner who's a broker, or or where are you digging up to find these uh, these great deals as far as your cost basis? <laughs> yeah, we like uh, we like a lot of lines in the water, so we use a, a bunch of different ways to go about finding our deals. One is my broker, you know, my business partner, my broker. He's in this business every day. He's got his ear to the ground, right? He's set up with all the real estate portals and all the automatic emails. So his inbox is flooded every single day with with commercial real estate deals. And he focuses mostly on industrial, but he sees all the office stuff and the, the retail stuff too. So that's one way. The other way is relationships with other brokers. So the most recent deal that I closed on was actually through a relationship that I had built with a Keller Williams commercial real estate broker who just works in one county in Metro Detroit that's growing and vibrant and they have a big hospital expansion taking place. And he just knows this market exceptionally well. He actually represented one of my tenants on a deal, a dog groomer of all things uh, to put into my building. And we just struck up a really good relationship. And I was like, hey, Trevor, if you ever find good value add deals, let me know. And one caught his eye in his backyard. He called me and we actually just closed on that a couple months ago, another medical outpatient building where we got a land contract on it. And that was an estate situation. So we, we feel pretty good about our cost basis there with some good long-term leases that we're even renegotiating to, to create more value. But that's another way, good relationships with other brokers. We also have uh, virtual assistants who are doing cold call campaigns for us. So we're you know, kind of scouring the industrial zoning in particular. We really like industrial right now, reaching out to the owners of those properties to find those retirement situations, going out of business situations, estate situations. I think we're coming into a wave of those types of situations because if you look at how much of commercial real estate is owned by the baby boomer generation and even older, there's a 20 year window that we're probably in the first or second inning on that's going to create a lot of real estate turning over. So we're using a lot of different methods, a few other ones, some automated searches through real estate portals to really just source as many deals as we can and, and find the best ones. That's awesome. So are you, are you mostly focused in the Detroit area or are you now branching out bigger? We're, I'd say we're Michigan centric. Uh, we do own one commercial property in between Detroit and Chicago. So more Southwest Michigan, which is cool. It's a, a light industrial building where we have a uh, food producer in that property. So they, they have a great lease. And then uh, we're in diligence on another one in South Haven. So that's on the Lake Michigan side. So actually a little closer to Chicago, but our unfair advantage, you know, where we really know the streets and, and the neighborhoods is is here in Metro Detroit, just based on, you know, both kind of being in business here for 20 years. So we we focus on that area, but we're not opposed to others. It's just we kind of like to, you know, leverage that advantage that we have to find the best deals. So to the rest of the world, you talk of Detroit. Detroit's got the reputation of, of probably being the last industrial city to to start recovering. Yeah. Yeah. You know, since the 70s. So I've read some great things recently. So how are things going in Detroit? Well, we mo mostly focused on, you know, the suburbs of of Metro Detroit. So de Detroit's um Detroit's an interesting market where uh, you know, Detroit proper and even Wayne County, I would say the county that Detroit is in is you know, largely lower income, uh, a lot more blue collar, some struggling neighborhoods, frankly, but you have a lot of wealth and affluence and growth in the suburbs, the, the rings around it, right? That's where the families are living. That's where the taxes are low and, and the neighborhoods are safe and the schools are good. And, and that's mostly where we focus, you know, especially like our suburban neighborhood office type stuff is, you know, professional office for 
attorneys and financial advisors and insurance companies and stuff like that. And those are just buildings down the street from your, your typical suburban market. But speaking of Detroit, that the city itself, the downtown is absolutely booming and it's really experiencing a rebirth that I think is probably only in the, the second or third inning. It's, it's really starting to take off now where it's catching those national headlines. And this has probably been happening for a good five years, but now the secret's kind of getting out. So I'm really bullish on downtown Detroit. We were just down there last week for the draft. Exceptional time. It's really cool to be part of a growth market like we are now because that that hasn't been the case for the majority of my life. I think that's some great information there on, on what's going on in some of these Midwestern cities that are starting to, to really see some growth now as there's onshoring. And so on that note, we're going to break this episode. And I'd like to thank Mike so much for being on the show today. Thank our listeners. And please join us for the next episode for the second half of our conversation with Mike Holwood. This has been an episode of Surgeon Syndicate. If you got value from this episode, you know other surgeons are hungry to become job optional, and you can help them by sharing this content today. Schedule a call and we can make a plan. Looking forward to having you with me on the next episode.